uh, Elizabeth Jones, welcome to RT. Uh, let's begin this uh, interview by asking why did UKIP decide to um, take part in this election, knowing that the Brexit is all over? Well, if only the Brexit were all over. Alas, the Brexit is not all over. We haven't even started negotiation as to the way forward. I understand that will be beginning in October. And we have no idea as to how Theresa May is going to play her hand. And now Theresa May took the extraordinary gamble of calling this early election. It may be that she's not even Prime Minister next Thursday. So there's so many variables. It's such a gamble that we need to be seen and we need to continue so that we can be assured that Brexit continues. Also, there are a slate of policies that we're the only party that's discussing them. For instance, no other party is discussing immigration. Labour doesn't mention it at all in its manifesto. The Conservatives say they're going to get it down to the tens of thousands, but give no time frame whatsoever. We're the only party discussing honest common sense and democracy. We've got a whole slew of proposals as to how to open up democracy and make it direct and open. Can you tell us briefly what the party you keep stand for in this particular election? What are the fundamental issues that you raise in this campaign? The fundamental issues in this campaign, clearly number one, are Brexit to ensure that that actually does go ahead. Number two, immigration. We're the only party that is not scared to discuss immigration and we want immigration to be uh, reduced to uh, zero net migration so that we can monitor our social and public services. And also, we're the only party discussing at length the public debt. This country has £1.4 trillion worth of debt. No other party seems to be discussing this. They seem to be entirely silent. Of course, I appreciate that the other parties help create this massive, massive debt. Um. Talking about you as a candidate, you are taking part in this election and representing UKIP in Bermondsey, uh, somewhere some, uh, in central London. Uh, first of all, what is your own program? Because you don't necessarily need to stick to the general basics of the party, but you have your own agenda as well. Up to a point, however, all candidates have to comply with the manifesto terms of their parties. And the local issues in London, I would say the number one issue, is housing. Now, the average income in this country is £26,000 per annum. But the average price of, let's say, a one- to two-bedroom flat in Southwark is about £300,000 to £600,000. People, ordinary people, like teachers, nurses, simply can't afford to live in central London. And that's a big problem because they can't get to work. It takes them a very long time to get to work. When they get to work, they're stressed. And it's not a good use of resources. So housing is a major problem. And also in Southwark, we've had some of the largest council uh, estates, you know, the areas where um, there's social housing, where people live in accommodation provided by the council. And Southwark Council, which is Labour dominated, um, has overnight removed entire communities from these estates and scattered them all around Essex, Kent or what have you and simply not replaced the housing. So there's a huge housing shortage and that is the critical policy, it's housing. Mm. Uh, when you work during this campaign, you meet people, you knock on the doors, you, you try to gain votes mm -hmm. and the support. What people talk to you about when you are saying, I am representing UKIP? Do they say you are a racist party? You are a right-wing party? What's the reaction of the people? Well, ordinary people going about their ordinary business when you're canvassing them, uh, you know, I've, I've not been said, oh, you're a right-wing person. Uh, their concerns are the concerns of the majority of the people in that area. It's housing. It's always housing. You know, they're worried that their children or their grandchildren won't have anywhere to live in London and that their family will be scattered and broken up around the, the country. So it's housing. Another issue is immigration people are very, very resentful of the way that repeated governments, Labour and Conservative, have completely ignored the public's concerns about uh, immigration, which of course has had a huge impact on housing, particularly in areas like Southwark. 
did you sense that the people of London who voted by 60% to stay, to remain within, uh, for, for, during the referendum, um, is that change of attitude to, because of the immigration issue? They want Brexit now? I don't think they, I think that many people have simply come to terms with it. And I think many, many people are feeling quite irritated by the fact that Theresa May, our Prime Minister, delayed so much in um, issuing Article 50. Now, to be fair, I'm not a Labour person, but to be fair to Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party, I remember on Friday the 23rd, 24th of June uh, last year, he was the first leader to say, the people have spoken, let's invoke Article 50 forthwith. The only one who said that. So he did actually respect democracy, and I have to give him credit for that. So I think a lot of people are getting very, very um, impatient. They don't know what on earth's going on and why there's such a delay. And that, of course, arouses suspicion uh, and distrust in our government. مشاهدينا يمكنكم متابعة هذه الحلقة من استوديو لندن وبيروت عبر موقعنا arabic.rt.com. So in light of what you said, that she has been bithering, the Prime Minister, she has delayed intriguing Article 50. Um, was it justified, this uh, length of nine months delaying the, um, the integration of Article 50? Well, I don't think it was. And clearly, Jeremy Corbyn agrees with me, because as I said earlier, Friday the 24th of jo June, he was the first leader who said, well, people have spoken, let's get on with it. Uh, now, I don't know what's going beho behind the scenes. Obviously, I'm not privy to the discussions with her civil servants and their uh, planning, but you'd have thought during the course of the campaign they'd have worked out an exit strategy uh, if the vote was won. So um, I think the delay is unnecessary, and I think it is a sign uh, of Theresa May as not being a forthright, direct, and energetic leader. As you know, she mentioned few times that uh, she will never call for a general election before 2020, mm -hmm. and then she changed her mind. And now, do you think uh, this decision uh, of calling for a general election as early as now uh, will make her regret her decision if she loses? Well, of course, if she loses, I, I, frankly, I think it's an extraordinary risk she's taken. I just don't understand uh, what on earth her advisers have been telling her. She had a comfortable majority. She could work with what she had. So why risk that with a snap election is extraordinary. And it may well be that she won't improve significantly uh, on the majority she previously had. So I don't understand the strategy. Probably this is why people are raising doubt about the decision, why she has taken this decision. Mm. Is it because Britain is not ready for Brexit? I don't, think it's not, it's, I don't think it's necessarily that Britain isn't ready for Brexit. It probably means that she isn't ready for Brexit. And she's not the most forthright, confident or energetic of political leaders, as I'm sure you would agree, or many people watching this would agree. So perhaps she feels that she needs to have an army of Conservative MPs around her before she has the courage to step forth and proceed with negotiations. It could be that. Who knows? I have no idea what was going on in her advisor's head. Since the campaign, she used only one particular issue, which is Brexit. She is calling for the people to vote for her, give her a big majority, so that she goes to the negotiations from a strong uh, and, and negotiate from strength uh, with the European unions. Do you think that's a valid justification to call for general election? Or, as you mentioned, she had already a comfortable majority at the House of Commons and she could have worked with that? Well, I can only answer that uh, emotionally, and my emotional response would be to that, that I would not want to take the risk. I think it puts the country into turmoil. It means people get tired of politics. You think, oh my God, not another election coming up. And I would not have risked it. However, I'm not Theresa May and I don't have her advisers. Perhaps she thinks that she does want to push through a very, very strong Brexit deal for us. She's already said at the beginning of this year that we would be leaving the single market. So perhaps she wants to be assured that she can achieve that. I'm optimistic. You have to be optimistic and look at the bright side. And I'm hoping that that is her strategy and she does have a strategy. But taking uh, what happened during this election campaign uh, up till now, uh, and there are so many surprises now. That's true. Uh, What's your reading to what happened so far in the, especially the re reduction of the gap between 
her and Jeremy Corbyn? I don't pay any attention to uh, pollsters anymore. I'm, th I'm sure you remember what happened during the referendum. I'm sure you re uh, remember what happened during the Trump campaign. And it seems to me that they're drawing their information from a very tiny pool of people. It may well be that people are impressed with uh, Jeremy Corbyn's performances on television, but I think the majority of people see Theresa May as a rather dull but safe pair of hands, and I think that she will succeed. She will win. She will get a, a bigger majority. How do you see the other opposition parties, such as the Lib Dem, UKIP, the Greens? They haven't come as strong as Jeremy Corbyn. What's the reason behind it, especially when your leader, Nigel Farage, is no longer taking part in this campaign? This is, well, Nigel is actually taking part now. I think that he will be, he's at Clacton, I think, either today or tomorrow. And he, That's the seat you won before. Yeah, and I think he'll probably be making his way to South Thanet now that the um, Craig McKinlay, who was the then Conservative MP, is now being charged for election fraud. So I think that's going to be a real hot potato now for UKIP. Uh, why, uh, why the other parties haven't really struck a chord? Well, frankly, I think the Lib Dems are sunk. They keep saying they want a second referendum. What on earth for? We've had one already. The people have spoken. It was a very large voter turnout. The die's being cast, so let's just get on and deal with it. So I think the Lib Dems' message is old hat and dated. The Greens' message, well, they promised the earth. They're going to give us free prescriptions, free this, free that, without any explanation of where the money's coming from. As for UKIP, well, I think that we do have a strong message. We are discussing uh, immigration. We're the only party that's quite strong on that. We're the only party uh, discussing changes to our democracy and how to make that more open. We want to introduce uh, referendums, national referendums, every two years, which will enliven uh, So where democracy. does the weakness lie within the UKIP? party well, while we, it has a shine like I, it I wouldn't say it well of course Nigel is an outstanding leader he is a world-class political orator and it's a terrible shame that he isn't there front of house so we have lost a great character with Nigel um, our, I think our policies are very strong our manifesto is excellent uh, but of course we have somewhat been overshadowed by the clash of the titans it's always oh is it gonna be the Tory is it gonna be the uh, Corbyn and of course Corbyn is so different from Theresa May. He strikes people as being very sort of internationalist. You know, he's been given a lot of previous support to the IRA, previous support to Hamas. And uh, of course, he, he supports a very, very, very socialist agenda, you know, agenda of high taxation. So this is very, very different. And because you've got two leading parties who are so different in policy, no fudging, no common ground there, that I think this has sort of captured the media's attention. In that case, how do you justify that over two million people, new people, have signed in to, to, to take part in this election and to vote, and mainly from the youth? If he is holding, if Jeremy Corbyn, is, as you said, is uh, coming with this left-wing program and with this left-wing agenda, but he is bringing, attracting the attention of the youth, is it because he is calling for free tuition, university fees? Uh, what, what is the secret behind that? Well, he's a bit of an overgrown teenager himself, isn't he? He's a bit, a bit of like a hippie student. So they probably, he probably strikes a chord with them when they see him with his little corduroy cap and little, uh, little red book with his uh, Labour manifesto. It's, it's quite cute in a way. It's almost like he's an overgrown teenager. But uh, you cannot assume that these two million uh, youngsters who signed up to vote are necessarily all Labour. They could well, for all you know, be um, Conservative. A big chunk of them could be UKIP. We just don't know. But I think it's absolutely fantastic that youngsters are now engaging with politics. They need to. To what extent, in your, view, in your view, have the media in general had affected the way the people see the small parties and how they are being portrayed, like UKIP, like the Greens? Do you think that the media are playing a major role in trying to direct this election in one way or another? Well, the media always do that, of course. You have the left-wing media, such as the uh, Daily Mirror newspaper, is always going to be pushing the Labour agenda and putting a certain slant on any policies or any news from any other party. Telegraph and Mail are always going to support the Conservatives. You know, that is a perpetual 
uh, conflict with our media, that that is always going to be the case. But is there a bias there? Of course there's bias, I've just said. Against you know, your party? Of course there's bias against our party, for sure. Uh, very much, I would say, from BBC, very much so, uh, because of the Brexit and also because of the uh, immigration. And, of course, also, um, you, one of UKIP's first policies was to ban the burqa, which I'm sure you're aware of. And also, UKIP wants to have a detailed analysis of public spend. Uh, you may not be aware, I'm sure you wouldn't be, but in, in Southwark, where I'm campaigning, the head of housing there, who's a civil servant, uh, who has overseen the chaos of Southwark, where there's been a significant reduction in council housing available to the public, uh, is earning, oh gosh, about £200,000 per annum plus pension, which is just absolutely obscene. And UKIP is bringing this to light. UKIP wants to have an overhauling of public finances. These salaries for fat cat civil servants have just got to stop. Most parties claim that their manifestos are costed and they know exactly how much they are spending and where the, the money is coming from. But somehow it seems like the only clear party that is really putting the figures on the manifesto rather than just verbally speaking about them is Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. Why the other parties, especially the Conservative Party, are hiding the costs? I don't think they're hiding the costs as such. They probably haven't worked them out. And I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's Labour has had a fully costed manifesto by any means whatsoever. In fact... Most. No, I don't think so. He's, they've been pulled apart uh, on, me, on the media. I know Andrew Neil really ripped into them about their lack of costing and lack of forecasting with costing. So I don't think they have been. UKIP has uh, costed its manifesto in very great detail because we are factoring in the fact that we will not be paying EU contributions. And when people talk about the cost of the EU, it's not just our monthly uh, membership. It's also the uh, VAT proportion we have to pay. We have to pay a surcharge if our economy does well. And we're also underpinning the uh, compensation toward banks. Now, and also underpinning the compensation toward Greece and uh, Italy. And that was factored into the Maastricht Treaty. So it's a huge expense. So that money will be coming back. We want to stop HS2, the high-speed train. That money will be coming back. We also want to cut overseas aid. At the moment, it's 0.7% of uh, gross national income. We want that reduced to 0.2 so that we can use that money for our health service, for, our, for NHS. So we fully costed it and worked it all out down to the penny. But I don't think Labour has. Are the people listening to Yuki? I, well, we have been somewhat crowded out now uh, because of, we don't have the fantastic Nigel Farage, who's a in very, no matter what you think of him, he is a great orator. Uh, we don't have him at our helm and also... I, not I, a, is not the replacement. Well, Nuttall is very different. He has a very different style, but Nigel is a superstar. I don't, he is a political superstar, like at Olympic. Whether you're left, right, he's a brilliant orator. And those people are rare. So, yes, he is a superstar, and I do miss him, and I think that perhaps we would be getting a bit more traction if he were front of house. But it is what it is. We can't trade back. Um, I think we are being crowded out, for sure. I, I don't think that our manifesto has been given sufficient attention. I think we've got some outstanding policies. Uh, which could do with some significant publicity. Now the, uh, the election rely mainly on the, the participation of the people. Are you expecting high turnout this time by talking to the people? Are they eager to go to the ballot box again? They had a referendum last year. They had, prior to that, uh, uh, on 2015, they elected David Cameron. Uh, I think people have had enough of uh, elections, have they? I think you're probably right. I, I'm expecting uh, not a very low turnout, but I'm not expecting a very high turnout for this uh, snap election. And also, it's right in the middle of the holiday season. Many people will be uh, away, and much depends on the weather. Traditionally, if it's raining, of course, the uh, Labour and perhaps Lib Dems won't bother to turn up at the polling station. So I'm expecting a lower turnout. Yes, you're right. I think many people are suffering from voter fatigue. مشاهدينا يمكنكم متابعة هذه الحلقة من استوديو لندن وبيروت عبر موقعنا arabic.rt.com. Uh, let's go back to the people who are voting. You mentioned that you keep um, one of the policies he mentioned is that against the burqa and the people should not use uh, women should not wear this. Um, 
to what extent, first of all, is the, uh, the, the Muslim vote and the minor, minority vote important in this election, in your view? Oh, it's very important. If I can just take you down memory lane to Brexit, uh, in Newham, uh, there was almost a leave vote in the London borough of Newham. And the London borough of Newham has uh, a very significantly high proportion of Muslims living there. So they will have voted to leave. So, of course, it is very, very important. And many Muslims uh, would support a burqa ban. So why UKIP is trying to harm this community by saying you cannot wear this, well, knowing I that in this country you are free as mm -hmm. long as you, your freedom doesn't impact or affect the others? I don't think it's harming the community at all. And also, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to refer to the Muslim community as a whole. They're all different. You've got British Turks, British Iranians, um, British Syrians, British Egyptians, British Algerians. And all of them ha have a different history, all have, or have different ambitions. But the bulk of the Muslim community are Asians from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, as you know, more than two million people from that, from that region. And those people that from that region don't traditionally uh, wear the burqa. It would be, um, I would, if they were wearing it, I would say it would be a, a somewhat pretentious move, almost like an aggressive fashion statement for them but now to suddenly really adopt that. is it really important to raise this issue? It is important because it's part of a general process of uh, integration. It's also necessary for women's rights and to ensure that we move forward as a nation, all together, all of us together, in friendship to the next stage, the post-Brexit world. And the, the women vote and the other minorities, mm -hmm. the gays, how important is that vote for you as far as this election is well, concerned? Of course, it's every vote from anyone is very, very important. We don't have to break it down into minorities or whoever minorities are. We, all, we are all a minority of one. You are your own person with your own prejudices, so am I. We are all a minority of one. Of course, everyone's vote is very, very important, very welcome. Now we talk about in the last few minutes about how do you see the future of Britain. Let's say that Theresa May wins mm -hmm. the election. What will happen? Well, it depends by how much. Let's say she gets a sweeping majority, then I assume that she will start the Brexit negotiations in October and they will go, I think, reasonably well. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a golden future, a wealthier, safer Britain. I'm, I think it's going to be very exciting. What about if the surprise happens and Jeremy Corbyn wins? Well, it would be very, it would be very amusing uh, to, to have the country ruled by... Um, I don't know if you were ever aware of uh, a comedy show called Citizen Smith, you know, the BBC comedy show, a very, very famous BBC, a long time ago, and it involved a very studenty left-wing character who was always, you know, oh, power for the people. So that would be quite amusing to be, uh, uh, have the Prime Minister as such Do a character. Do you feel for Brexit if Jeremy Corbyn comes to power? Well, no, because I think that Jeremy Corbyn, I don't necessarily agree with his policies, but he does strike me as a man of some integrity, and I think that he would abide by the people's uh, choice. It depends what sort of Brexit we're going to get, though, and how uh, that will impact on our economy and how it will impact on uh, migration. You keep had one seat before at the House of Commons, and you no longer have that seat. Uh, are you expected to win anything? Well, I do hope so. <laughs> I hope we get something. No, I mean... Sensing the mood of the nation, well, are, you, are you sure? To what extent are you sure that you will gain one or two? Well, seats? I'd hope we would gain one or two, perhaps in Hartlepool or now South Thanet. Now we've got the issue of Craig McKinley, the Conservative MP, being charged for election fraud. And I would hope so uh, in Clacton and also in Thurrock in Essex, where we've got a very, very strong uh, showing. And your own? Oh, chances? no, I've got no chance. No, it's going to be between Labour and Lib Dem. No one else is going to get a look in in Southwark. Why? It traditionally is so. It is a, a, a very um, left-wing constituency. No Conservative will get in. Your women's charm didn't work? Your women's charm <laughs> won't work there. <laughs> Lisa, thank you very much indeed for um, participating in this uh, debate. Uh, and Mushahidina, uh, shukran lakum ala al mutaba'a. Nantakil bikum ila Moscow li mutaba'at baqiyat baramijina. Wasanutaba'a tada'iyat hadihi al intikhabat al amafi al halqa al qadima min studio London ma hasan zaytuni. Shukran.